What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to something that you guys have been waiting for for quite a while. I'm very sorry about that, but we are back doing the uh, do doing the Tales from the Pizzaplex live reads. Fun fact, this is going to be the last one. What? Um, yes, so B72, if you don't know, is coming out soon. I should have probably found the release date beforehand. I think it's coming out next month. Anyway, this was quite an early live read. This is quite an early leak of the book. And um, it blows... Uh, apparently it blows some of the lore reveals out of the water. Like, like, this is a big lore reveal that we're going to get today. So be ready. This is going to be a really good story. We're not reading B72 today. We're going to be reading the final story in B72. Mainly because I want to make a video on this. Um, I've heard a little bit about what the lore reveal is going to be. I don't know much detail about it though. Um, and this live read happened three weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm very late. I'm very late. But um, I'm here nevertheless. And we are going to be reacting to Ditto Phobia. It is not about Pokemon. I, s <laughs> I swear. It's not going to be about Pokemon. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually quite sad because this is the eighth Tales from the Pizzaplex book and this is going to be the last one. Um, apparently the epilogue is, is done. The epilogue finishes, the epilogue story finishes in this book. So this is going to be the last Tales from the Pizzaplex book. Are there going to be more books? I hope so. <laughs> I actually strangely hope so. Um, I feel like as though, although a lot of people wouldn't want it because there's so many books to keep up with, I would actually love to see a new series later on. I just don't think it's going to happen at this current time. I feel like we're going to get two two more games, something like that. We're going to get Help Wanted 2, and then we're going to get another game that goes into this new sort of era of FNAF, and then we're going to get a book. Or we're going to get a series of books. Uh, not to mention... Next month, we will be getting the FNAF movie along with the FNAF movie book. Uh, and then there's going to be a lot of merchandise and stuff to do with that, I'm sure, um, that we can go through. But um, yeah, this is going to be it for now. It's, it's crazy to think about. I feel like Tales from the Peter X 1 Lally's game came out like a month ago. <laughs> it, it obviously didn't, but um, it felt like yesterday. Anyway... Dittophobia, this is officially the final story of Tales from the Pizza Plex, so you know it's going to be big. Let's get straight into it. Rory's eyes shot open, his body rigid. He stared into the murky greyness that pressed in around him. He held his breath so he wouldn't make a sound. Rory's head and shoulders were propped on two fluffy, uh, puffy pillows that at the moment gave him no comfort at all. The room, though dim, was light enough that Rory could take in the, close, the closet door opposite the foot of his bed and his two bedroom doorways, which faced each other from the left and right of his bed. <laughs> a re uh, like, crazy. That's amazing that it's already set us up in, like, the first two sentences that we are in the FNAF 4 bedroom. We are in, in some capacity, we are in the FNAF 4 bedroom. Where is the story going to go? I actually have no idea. <laughs> I knew that this story would be about FNAF 4. That is the extent of what I know, essentially. I think I know a few more small things, but... Um, yeah, so we're in the FNAF 4 bedroom. Tales from the Pizzaplex, and we're getting a FNAF 4 story? Hmm. This one must be important in some way. Um, the pillows blocked his peripheral vision, so he couldn't see the small blue-grey nightstand that held his little red alarm clock with the two bells that are like ears on top of the clock's face. Is that something that's in FNAF 4? I might have to look back at that, but I'm, I, I know that the blue-grey nightstand is there, obviously. Um, Rory intuitively... Oh, alarm clock, as in the alarm clock that beeps at the end of the night. Cool. Uh, even so, Rory intuitively... <laughs> intuitively knew that it was just after midnight. He knew this because every night at about this time, the same thing happened. Some small, unidentifiable noise, maybe a scrape or maybe a tap, woke him from a deep sleep. A, the noise woke him and then a flash of curved metal appeared in the gap between the white folding doors that enclosed Rory's closet. <gasps> Foxy! <laughs> Rory uh, sucked in a sharp breath. The whoosh of it was amplified in the stillness of the darkened room. Oh no, Rory thought. They know I'm awake. Hmm. So it seems like he's been here for a while. He squeezed his eyes shut. Rory had turned seven just a few months ago, although his memory of his small party, just him, his friends, and his friend Wade, with the balloons and the big chocolate birthday cake, 
he would thought had ju had too much icing. It was too vague that had it had seemed like it had happened years ago instead of weeks. Maybe he actually did. Maybe he's actually been here for years. But I don't. We don't know. We don't really know what the FNAF 4 bedroom is. Whether it is an actual bedroom or if it's an experimentation facility. Um, could Rory be the crying child? <laughs> Maybe. May I, I wonder where this is going. I I, I want to know. However, as young as Rory was, he was old enough to know that closing his eyes wasn't a good defense against the creatures that were after him. If Rory wanted to survive the night, he had to know what was coming. Open your eyes, he shouted at himself in his head. All the creatures appeared at once. Once they came into view, the creatures moved slowly. That didn't make them any less scary. Rory knew from experience that the creatures' pace wouldn't make it easier for him to get away. He was never able to avoid them no matter how slow they were. Rory doesn't move and he just stares at the creatures. Oh, by the way, thank you so much to Peep for uh, for doing the live read this time around. Uh, I think you're Australian, right? Um, because and, and that's how the book came so early because it's just like a different different place. Um, from out of the closet, the piercingly sharp point of a pirate's hook skiced through the air as the rotting ruin of a fox-shaped creature with multiple rows of jagged teeth crept out into the room. Lovely, lovely. The fox's eyes shone stark white in the surrounding darkness. Those eyes were focused directly on Rory. Two more pairs of eyes appeared, one set each in the open gaps of the doors to the left and to the right of the bed. Two more creatures were prepared to slink toward Rory's head. Both doors opened wider. The creatures began to enter the room. The creature on the right was a decayed version of a yellow chick, its body so riddled with holes that the only barest hints of a metal skeleton held it together. Like the fox, it had a massive mouth full of spiky teeth. Its lower jaw was so separated from its upper one that Rory could see the blue-grey pattern of his room's wallpaper through the space. That's creepy, that's a cool detail. Clutched in the chick's massive hand with long razor-like nails was a bright pink cupcake with glowing white eyes and a similar separated jaw full of serrated teeth. The cupcake riding on the chick's big hand was what entered the room first, slipping through the gloomy gap in the hall in the doorway that led to the right hallway outside Rory's room. Ah, cheek is on the right. The fact that the cupcake was a cupcake and had a smaller mouth made it no less terrifying. Uh, when the cupcake opened and closed its jaw, it made a snapping sound that raised goosebumps on Rory's skin. The creature coming from the left was similar to the other two in its decomposing awfulness and its pointy teeth and nails. The nails were the first thing Rory could see as the creature slowly slipped its hand past the edge of the door and stepped into the room. The creature was a monstrous distortion of a purple-blue bunny, complete with long mottled bunny ears that rose above its oversized, open-mouthed face. <laughs> Scott knew what he was doing, calling him purple-blue. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. The fact that this monster was bunny-like made it the worst of the three for Roy because he loved bunnies. Ah, I feel like this is kind of... I feel like this might... I feel like this might be written by Scott, you know? I feel like Scott may have had a big hand in, in doing this because he he always said... He always said that Bonnie was the scariest. I always said that Foxy was the scariest, <laughs> personally, but... um, Yeah, that's... Hmm... Because I, I feel like that's like a very explicit thing to say, like Bonnie is the scariest. Anyway, it's very specific. This monster showed him that even the best of things could be contorted and wrecked, twisted into something ugly and gross. That's a great line right there. And, and like, we're even talking about bunnies here. And, and, and the fact that we're talking about bunnies and the fact that um, th but the best of things, bunnies, can be contorted and wrecked, twisted into something ugly and gross. We could be talking about Springtrap as well. It's kind of like a double meaning there. Um, and I and I wonder if Springtrap will come into play into any of this. Probably not, but... Um, the creatures made a clacking and blurring sound when they walked, but they moved slowly, almost like they were floating. They weren't floating, though. When the creatures were in motion, Rory's room shook. The walls rattled, and Rory's bed vibrated. Or maybe his bed felt like it was vibrating because he was quivering. I'm getting some, some sort of um, connections to Help Wanted here. Um, the, the story Help Wanted. Uh, as the creatures approached the bed, the puff, puff, puff of heavy breathing filled the room. The panting inhales and exhales, however, uh, the panting inhales and exhales, however, weren't coming from the creatures. Rory was the one making all that racket. I feel like he's hallucinating here. The creatures, except for their clunking steps, made very little sound. Their movement created the faintest of chinks and whirs and the occasional creak, and somehow the fact that they didn't 
barrel of Rory with loud roars or bellows made them all that more horrid. The near silence of their advance gave Rory too much time to imagine what they would do to him when they reached him, and they'd reached him. Rory felt his mattress shift, his gaze whipped to the left. The monster bunny was pressed against the foot of the bed, the bunny was leaning forward, he was reaching for Rory. Finally Rory could move, it felt like he'd been released from a tractor beam. Rory launched himself out of the bed on the right, squinting toward the advancing chick. He was pretty sure he could scamper past it, and a mutilated brown bear with even larger teeth than those of the other creatures shot up from beneath Rory's bed and blocked his escape. Oh, Freddy's under the bed? Wait, why did I never put that together? <laughs> Wait, do people know that? <laughs> I never put it together that Freddy would be under the bed. Oh, that's funny. Monsters under the bed. I never even thought about that. Duh. Um, I'm so stupid. Um, the bear wore a black top hat and a black bow tie. Neither gentlemanly accessory made the bear any less gruesome. With a raspy rumble, the bear's mouth hinged wider and wider. It leaned toward Rory. Cold metal clamped around Rory's wrist. Hot pain pierced his skin. Rory screamed. Rory sat up. His chest heaving, he gripped the edge of the quilt that lay atop his tangled sheets and blankets. Sweat trickled down his neck, his cotton pyjamas clung to his skin. Rory's heartbeat sounded like a full drum set pounding out an impossibly fast riff that filled the room. His eyes wide, Rory jerked his head left and right. The creatures were gone. So was the night. Hmm. Is it reset? Through the shades covering the window high up above the head of Rory's bed, I don't think that's in FNAF 4. don't think there's a window above the bed, but whatever. Bright sunlight streamed in the room. Morning was here. The nightmare was over. Even if Rory had looked up toward the window, he knew he wouldn't see the sun. The window was well above any height he could reach, and it was covered with a shade that let in light, but hid any potential view that may be seen by a very tall person. Rory never understood why his room's window was so close to the ceiling, but he'd gotten used to it. <laughs> that's so funny. I love how that's the explanation for why there's no window in FNAF 4. That's so funny. It's just so high up to the ceiling that you can't see it in FNAF 4. Um, nothing looked out of place. It's blue-grey furniture, a tall chest of drawers which held a purple three-bladed fan and the lava lamp his uncle had given him, and a shorter dresser that held a, a yellow porcelain lamp with a grey striped shade was placed where it always was. Brother! If you're saying Tales from the Pizza Plex is not canon at this point, please at least rethink. Look at this image and tell me it is not perfectly describing this image. I, I don't know what else to say if, if you don't think that Tales from the Pizza Plex is canon at this point. It's it's crazy. Or in the same canonicity. Uh, or, sorry, continuity. Both pieces of furniture sat against Rory's lavender grey and white wallpapered walls. The wallpaper in Rory's room covered only the top two thirds or so of the walls. Below the wallpaper there was something called a chair rail. A chair rail? Rory's mum was an interior decorator and she made sure he knew what things in houses were called. It's interesting how this Rory... This is Rory's room. It is interesting how this is Rory's room and how it's mentioning Rory's mum as if like they do do actually live here. So maybe it's not an experiment. Maybe it is maybe it actually is night nightmares. Hmm, I feel like we we have to get confirmation in this story otherwise it's a lost cause. Uh, a chair rail was molding on the wall that divided the upper wallpaper from a different kind of wallpaper. Oh, a chair rail like a yeah, whatever. Um, upper wallpaper from a different kind of wallpaper. In Rory's room, it was grey and blue striped that covered the wall between the chair rail and the floor. There we go. You can you can really clearly see that the stripes that uh, separate the wallpaper. Uh, whenever Rory walked past the moulding, it was about the level of his chest. Okay, Rory was four and a half feet tall, so he knew what meant that meant the moulding was about three and a half feet off the floor. The tall chest sat against the wall opposite Rory's bed. It was next to the double-doored closet. The dresser was on the right wall next to the doorway that led out of the hallway that went past his parents' room before reaching the living room. Okay. Cool. Uh, I, no, I'm just, kind of, I'm just kind of thinking about it. 
and trying to connect it to the FNAF 4 minigame house as well, but obviously that's, I think that's a lost cause as well because it's just a completely different layout. The white six panel door was closed, so was the matching door on the other side of the room. That door led to another hall, which also went to the living room. Rory's bathroom and the two other rooms opened off that left side hall. Staring at his folding closet door, Rory noticed it was closed too. He made sure it was closed before he went to bed. The door was louvered, according to his mum. Rory wished it wasn't. The open slats of the louvers made the closet far too exposed to suit Rory. He knew what lived in that closet and he wished he had solid doors he could keep closed and locked. But would a solid locked door help? The two hallway doors were solid and Rory always made sure they were closed and locked. Even so, the creatures always got the doors open every single night. They're just nightmares, he told himself. His voice sounded unnaturally loud in the room. Rory's voice seemed loud, he thought, because it was the only sound in the room. His bedroom was otherwise silent. No, not silent. A barely there hissing sound came from the vents in the ceiling above Rory's head. A s <laughs> the vents in the ceiling above Rory's head. Hmm. The hissing sound was very soft, like a steady whisper. Rory thought the sound was soothing. After checking under his bed and finding nothing, we get more room descriptions. Even though he'd probably get in trouble for it, he'd left a few toys scattered around the floor of the room. A blue telephone with large googly eyes and red wheels that sat contently, contentedly next to a green plastic fish near the chest of drawers. That's a fish? <laughs> You're telling me that's a fish? Are you kidding me? That is not a fish. Hmm. I have a... Hmm... I feel like I feel like me getting vibes from Help Wanted, the story Help Wanted, are good vibes because I feel like you know there's a hissing sound coming from the vents. I feel like there's illusion discs technology happening here. I I do feel like that's the case. I feel like because obviously under the FNAF 4 house, we we know that under the FNAF 4 gameplay house that there is in fact the sister location location uh circus babies entertainment rentals so people theorize that the nightmares are happening because of the illusion discs underneath i feel like that's that's not a bad prediction right i feel like there must be illusion disc play here especially with all of the illusion technology that we've been seeing throughout these books there has to be some sort of illusion at play with the fnaf 4 nightmares um so yeah um I guess this is what Scott meant when he said there are holes in our understanding. What, the, the the green plastic fish? Yeah. There's no way that's a freaking fish. A f I thought it was a bug. I did think it was a bug. A few feet from the rolling phone, a purple robot was hanging out in front of the dresser. Between the telephone and the robot, a rabbit stood up straight a few feet from the closet doors. The sides of the rabbit made Rory uneasy. Here we go. There's the robot. Um, There's no rabbit, I don't think. I don't see a rabbit, but... There we go. Oh, an alarm clock. Oh my god, it's literally fully described this room. Pfft, wow, okay. Uh, quilt description time. He clenched the white fabric of his quilt and looked at the hand sewn triangles, sewn triangles, sorry, that were patchwork together with the white material. The triangles had many patterns. Some looked like circles and some were leaf or flower shaped. All of the patterns shared the same colors of blue, beige, and yellow. Brother, Tales from the Pizza Plex is canon. <laughs> if it takes the last story to find out, then I then that's fine. But if if you if you don't say it's canon at this point, I I don't know what you're doing, man. Rory's grandma and some of her friends had made the quilt for him. His mum said the quilt didn't match the colours in his room, but he didn't care. He liked it. Glancing at the rabbit again, Rory called out, "Mom!" When his mum didn't answer, he tried, "Dad." His dad didn't respond either. His parents were probably getting ready for work and didn't hear him. Rory shrugged. He should stop being a weirdo and get ready for school. He goes to the left hallway where we get left hallway description time. Rory looked left and right along the length of the wood-floored hall. Like his room, the hall had the chair rail thing and two different wallpapers. The paper above the rail was kind of burgundy orange with a fancy diamond-shaped pattern. The paper below was a dark grayish brown with splotches of lighter grey in sort of uh, tree-ish shapes. 
okay? Nothing was in the hall other than the small hall table with one drawer, a lamp similar to the one in, his, in Roy's room, the one in the colour of a pale pumpkin sat on the table. Cool. He goes into the bathroom, the hallway, and washes himself. Nothing special about the bathroom's decor. It's painted light blue, the tiled floor is dark blue and white striped, and the bath, toilet, and sink are white. Are white. He did his best to smooth his short hair with his fingers, but it didn't want to lay down. His blond, his dark blondish waves, his mom said his hair looked like a hayfield on a rainy day, stuck out from his head in multiple directions. I don't think this is a crying child. I don't think this is a crying child. His hair stood out even further than his big ears, which poked out from the sides of his narrow head. Here's the thing. If this isn't the crying child... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big prediction here. If this isn't the crying child, it's just some random child, right? Some random child. Why the hell is he in Afton's house? It must be some sort of testing facility, I think. It has to be, right? That's where this story is going, 100%. It's going to be a big rabbit hole of like, holy schmucks, this is what Afton's been doing. I I really hope so. I, I hope it's like a mystery of like, what what is what is Afton been doing to these children? Um, his hair even stood out further on his big ears, which poked out from the sides of his narrow head. Rory noticed the skin around his freckles was paler than usual. He also saw that the skin under his eyes was darker than the rest of his face. The whites around his greenish brown eyes were streaked with spider webby red lines. He tried to smile to reassure himself that he didn't look as bad as he thought he did. Just bearing at the small white teeth and his wide mouth made his head and face look like a crazy old jack-o'-lantern. That's a nice little nod to the jacko uh, jack animatronics. Um, he closed his mouth and left the bathroom. Uh, returning to his bathroom, sorry, returning to the bedroom... Rory shed his pajamas and put his jeans and a and put on jeans and a green t-shirt. Both the jeans and the t-shirt with baggy. That's a great cool peep right there. That's that's a really good detail. They he's wearing the exact same as the children who went to the pizzerias in the FNAF two mini games or three? No, FNAF two mini games. No, FNAF three. Ah, no, FNAF two. I think. Rory wasn't a big kid. He was smaller than most of the boys in his class. His mom, however, kept expecting him to start. A growing spurt, so he she brought him clothes that were too large. Rory hoped his mum was right. Rory's dad loved football, and Rory wanted to get, to get big so he could play. Yeah, this isn't this definitely isn't Afton or Afton's child. Uh, Rory could remember tossing a football back and forth with his dad, but the memory was hazy. They hadn't done it in a long time. Oh, oh yeah, just to say it, <laughs> it's not necessarily that um. That Afton doesn't like football. Sure, he could like football if he wants, if he, if he wants to. I just think it's portraying him in good light at the moment. You know that there's like no, there's no mysterious details about him. So I don't think it's Afton at the moment, but I could be wrong. Um, the hallway to the right of Rory's room was the same as the one on the left. His parents' room, a bathroom, and one other room opened off this hall. All three rooms' doors were closed. He calls for his parents again, and they don't respond again. He walks down the wooded floored hallway and outside of the bathroom door in that hallway. This has to be an illusion. Through the door he could hear the sound of a running shower. Mom! He yelled out. She didn't respond. He decides to open the bathroom door. He took a deep breath. Expecting to inhale the scent of soap or shampoo coming from the bathroom, Rory was surprised when he smelled something sharper. Something like medicine. Oh. He shouts out and still gets no response. Whatever. His dad must have already gone to work. He went to work early a lot. His mum was probably thinking hard about some decorating project while she showered, and that was why she didn't hear him. She was always thinking about work. Even when Rory talked to her, he could tell she was thinking about her work. As he talked, her gaze would drift off to the side, and he could tell that she wasn't interested in what he was saying. He guessed that was normal, though. Mostly, he talked about his friend Wade and their clubhouse. That was probably boring to his mum. I literally just watched, um, just watched Elemental the new Pixar film, and uh, and now I've just got, like, this water guy in my head. Anyway, Rory went down the hall and stepped into what his mum called their great room. This part of the house was open concept. That meant that the living room and dining room were one big space. Off to the side of those areas, a big island with wood stools divided the large space from a kitchen with shiny appliances and white cabinets. This is a nice house, man. I want to live here. Passing a long rectangular dark coloured wood dining table with six dark blue plush chairs. Six. 
Roy went around the island and walked to the end of the kitchen. That's where the fridge was. He was hungry and his mum hadn't set anything out on the island for breakfast. Um, as he ate, Roy listened for his mum. He had to be. She had to be out the shower, didn't she? Apparently not. Roy could still hear her shushing crackle of the shower's running water. This has to be all an illusion, surely. He realises he's going to be late for school, so he cleans the island because his mum's also a freak over crumbs. Hurrying out the kitchen, Rory spotted his red backpack next to the end of the blue and white checked sofa in the living room part of the great room. Rory picked it up and slipped it over his shoulders. He hurried across the living room's wood floor toward the... He stopped. Where was the front door? Oh, that's so good. Ah, oh, this story's great already. This story is so good. Where was the front door? That's amazing. That's a great short sentence right there. Because like, it's been it's been building up the fact that Rory's been living here a while. It seems natural for him to be here. This is clearly like familiar to him. This is clearly his family's home. His mom is decorating the place. There is this great room that his mom always calls the great room. Yet he doesn't know where the front door is. Hmm. Isn't that just a little bit suspicious, right? And and I and I love that. That is such a great line. It sent chills through my body. Because he should know where the front door is. That that should be the most obvious thing about the house. The front door. That's the first place you walk through to get into the house. So it seems like he's never he's never been out of the house. Or this is weird. Like maybe th there's some like memory distortion thing happening. Maybe something to do with illusion disc again. It's interesting. I, I, I wonder where this story's going. Turning in a full circle, Rory frowned as he tried to find the door that would lead out of the house. For some reason, he couldn't remember where it was supposed to be. And, and again, like, I, sorry to keep pausing, but like, I feel like the fact that we haven't seen the parents directly feels like this guy has been tr uh, has been captured and is now suffering from Afton's creation. Uh, or Afton's experiment rooms. This is interesting. Um, the living room, like most of the rest of the house, had two different wallpapers separated by another chair rail. The paper in here had vertical stripes of bl bright blue and white above the rail. These colours matched the sofa and the rectangular rug under the oval coffee table in front of the sofa. Below the rail, under vertical, oh, sorry, wider vertical stripes of beige and cream colours matched his dad's recliner and a TV cabinet. Is this... I don't think this is the FNAF 4 minigame house. I, I, I'm i inclined to believe this isn't. Um, I mean, it would make sense that it isn't. Um, wait, so things are being pieced together in my mind. That, that must mean that this is an experimentation room, or an experimentation house, sorry, and that Afton has his own separate house, that is the FNAF 4 minigame house. But then in that case, what the hell is Midnight Motorist? Midnight Motorist wouldn't be Afton in that case. Or Midnight Motorist would be Afton capturing that kid. Oh! Am I onto something? <laughs> Am I onto something? Is Orange Guy just some random father? Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, um... I was just considering a few options. I feel like I might be onto something there. Hmm. Hmm. Tell me if I'm right in the comments below. Uh, a couple of paintings and two groupings of family photos hung on the blue and white part of the walls. The rest of the walls were bare, but for a couple of windows covered with cloth shades. The shades were thin enough that daylight shone through them, but they were thick enough to make it impossible to see through to the outside. He didn't care about seeing through the windows, though. He wanted a door, not a window. Rory walked out around the entire living room and dining room area. As he did, his brain started getting a little mushy. With every step he took, he felt a little drowsier. By the time he had gone around the room twice, he felt like he was in a fog. Why couldn't he find his way out of his house? And where was his mom? Rory starts trying to open all the doors in the house, but they're all locked. Most of the doors he goes to, he doesn't even remember where they lead. Wow. Wow, that's better, he said. Once again, his words sounded unusually loud. And behind, and behind the boom of his voice, the steady hissing above his bed sounded like a subdued murmur, as if someone, maybe Rory's mum, was saying, shh, letting him know everything was okay. Oh. 
Oh, it's it's um, that sh is is the illusion disc technology. I'm calling it. That's that's putting him at bay. That's keeping him from leaving. And now it's gonna be suddenly nighttime again, and he's gonna be like, "Whoa, why is it nighttime again?" <laughs> um, let me just put my laptop on charge. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay, Rory, uh, Rory smiled dreamily. Everything's okay, he told himself. This time when he spoke, he made sure to keep his voice low. Huh. He entered the kitchen. He felt like he was missing something. He had to have been. He should have been able to pick up his backpack and leave to go to school. That should be a simple thing, shouldn't it? Not sure what else to do, Rory walked through the house again and again. He was so caught up in his quest to find the door that he lost track of time. He couldn't tell if time was passing slowly or quickly and he didn't care. He just wanted to find the door so he could go to school. Rory then realises that the sun is going down. <sighs> oh my god, this is terrifying. Imagine being a kid in this situation. Time for bed, Rory said to himself. Good, he thought. He was so tired. He was more than ready to get under covers and snuggle into his nice warm bed. Yeah, it's an illusion, man. It has to be. I don't think, I don't think he was there an entire day looking around the doors. There has to be an illusion. It has to be like a fake window. Has to be a fake shower, has to be fake doors. 100%. Um, where, where am I? <laughs> the sound reminded him of his mum's shower. He couldn't remember if he'd heard the shower the last time he'd gone down the right side hall. He must not have. It is, there is this weird shushing sound. Hmm. His mum must have left for work when Rory was in the left side hall. She would have figured that he'd already gone to school, so she wouldn't have gone looking for him. By now, Rory's room was lit only by the weak glow of his nightstand lamp, a smaller version of the lamp on top of his dresser. The little lamp threw a faint circle of light out around his bed. Beyond that circle, the rest of the room was in shadows. All the shapes that squatted in those shadows suddenly looked dangerous and threatening. Rory quickly went to his closet door. He tossed his clothes into a blue plastic laundry basket on the floor and then closed the door firmly. He scuttled to his bed, threw back the quilt and other covers and dove dove under them. He pulled the covers up to his chin and looked around the room. The lumpy shapes in the room made Rory nervous, but at least none of them moved. Yet. Rory risked slipping an arm from beneath his covers to turn off his bedside lamp. He closed his eyes, letting his steady hiss from the vents lull him to sleep as the drowsiness he'd felt all day finally claimed him. Okay, different theory. It's coming from the vents. This hissing sound is coming from the vents. There has to be some sort of gas, right? <laughs> some gas is putting him at bay, like some sanity glass or insanity glass. Hmm. Yeah, there's like some sort of toxins or something. Oh, I love this. This is this is such a good story. I love it. I love how connected this story is because it's going to tell the whole story of FNAF 4 for us. And that's just amazing. That's so cool. It was midnight again. He was sure, or close enough. Uh, a scurrying sound came from the closet at the other end of the room. Rory lifted his head from the pillow very softly. He raised his head only an inch, if that. He blinked several times, willing his eyes to adjust to the room's darkness. He had to see what the sound was. The closet door was cracked open. He closed it before he'd gone to bed, hadn't he? Rory watched the gap. He stared so hard, so unblinkingly, that his eyes started to sting. But he didn't blink. If he did, he might miss if the door opened further. Don't blink, don't blink, he blinked. As he opened his eyes again, he caught the tip of the gleaming metal hook curling around the edge of the closet door. He had, he had a metallic rasp, or he heard, sorry, a metallic rasp. The door creaked. A pair of glowing white eyes looked through the crack between the closet doors. No. Rory checked the doors that led out to the hallways that flanked his room. He closed them, too. He was positive about that. They weren't closed now. Knife-like nails curled around the edges of the door. One blazing white eye peered through each opening. What is this? I, one eye open when I'm sleeping. One eye. <laughs> what the hell is that? That's so funny. <laughs> that guy is talented. Uh, one eye. As Rory watched, trying to control the shudders that wanted to rack his body, 
Both doors opened even more. One eye in each doorway became two. I've got that song stuck in my head now. Now four eyes stared at him from the open doors. No, six. Rory could see a smaller set of radiant white eyes lower in the right side gap. It was the murderous cupcake with the gaping mouth full of teeth. Rory kept watching. What else could he do? He couldn't move, even though he wanted to run more than anything. The closet door and the hall doors opened wider. The gigantic mouths full of shark-like teeth appeared. The tattered bodies wormed into view. Zombie-like versions of a fox, a chick, and a bunny began to plod toward Rory's head. Run! Rory's mind screamed at him. 50 pages out of 70 left! Oh my god, I'm going so slow. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's speed up. Let's speed up a little bit. Rory was able to get his body to work, but before Rory could take a step, another pair of gleaming eyes was suddenly right in front of him. A cavern of mouth of pointy teeth uh, were inches from Rory's face. Wow. Um, cool. As he lifted to himself breathe, Rory realised that the sound of his breathing was a gentle percussion beneath the steady whisper coming from above him. The vents, their usual hiss, comforted Rory. The night was over, all was well, or was it? Rory sat up, his hands balled into fists. He looked around the room. Everything was as it should have been. Rory swung his legs out of the bed. Mom, he called. Dad! Rory's parents didn't respond. He shrugged and went to his closet. Everything in the closet was what it was supposed to be in the closet. There was nothing scary in sight. It's interesting that there aren't plushies of... Well, there isn't a foxy plushie. That's interesting to me. It, it, it says to me that maybe he doesn't know about Freddy's in the first place. Like, he's not calling them nightmare, Nightmarish Freddy. He's not calling them Nightmare Foxy. Like, he doesn't really know who Foxy is, I think. I feel like. I don't know. Um, Rory gathered his clothes, closed his clo closet, and left the room to go to the bathroom. He examined his pinched face in the mirror. Was he paler than he should have been? He was fine. Who cared what colour his skin was? <laughs> Based Scott line. Oh, nice. Going back into the room, Rory made his bed. Then he left his room through the right side door. He headed down the hall and called his parents again. When they didn't answer, he concluded that his dad was at his work and his mum was in the shower. He could hear the shower running through his parents' bathroom door. His dad usually went to work early. His mum took very long showers. It wasn't a problem. Uh, Rory was used to fending for himself. Uh, mum, you out the shower yet? She didn't answer him. Maybe she'd gone out the shower and left for work while he was eating. His mum often told him that when he was eating, he wouldn't notice an elephant if it sat now next to him. Rory grinned at the idea of a visiting elephant as he pulled on his backpack and headed toward the elephant crushes out. No, whatever. Where was the front door? Okay. Rory's eyes shot open. The creatures came at midnight like always. They somehow got the doors open. They skulked into the room. They closed in around Rory's bed. White eyes, sawtoothed mouths, decomposing bodies. Clankety clank. It's interesting that he calls them decomposing bodies. That is interesting. The fourth creature appeared. The bear with the top hat drew itself up to loom over Rory as if arising from a grave under Rory's bed. Mouth opening and possibly wide, the bear aimed its teeth at Rory's head. Oh, wow. The bear aimed its teeth at Rory's head. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Rory's cry jolted him awake. Um, he has a toast and apple for breakfast. Hallway, halfway down the hall, Rory stopped. He listened carefully. Rory was familiar with the normal noises in his house. He was used to hearing a hiss from the vents and the hum of the refrigerator's motor. Again, a hiss from the vents. The hiss and the hum. Because his mom took so many showers that were really long, he well knew the sound of continually running water too. I feel like that's not a shower, mate. I feel like it's not a shower. Now though, Rory could hear something else. The noise was a knocking sound that was coming from inside one of the walls. Which one? The knocking sound wasn't a knocking like a person would do. There wasn't some little trapped fairy or something on the walls. No, the knocking Rory heard was the clanking sound of an engine. Uh, this was this clanking sound an engine might make if it was having trouble running. The bangs in the walls sounded like an engine about to fail. Hmm, there's some mechanisms in the house. <laughs> there are some mechanisms. The sound stopped just as abruptly as it had started. When it stopped, though, everything stopped. This is giving me flashbacks again to have wanted when Steve realised that it was all like a factory and there were like vents that, or, or sorry, trap doors that they would come out of and he, you could hear like things turning and stuff like that and you, you could tell that he was, he was just trapped in this location rather than in this beautiful house with a beautiful wife uh, on a snowy day uh, with DJ Dan, the music man. 
Um, this thing stopped. The, so the sound of the shower stopped. The only thing that continued was the refrigerator's hum. Other than that, the house went silent. Um, he watched little specks of dust dance in the stream of light that slanted down over his bed and stretched his arms over his head. He felt great. Rory dropped his arms back to the sides and took a, a big breath of air. He wiggled his legs and flexed his toes. He felt different from how he usually felt in the morning. Why? The answer came quickly. No nightmares. Ah, oh, it's, it's a fault in the system. It's a fault in the mechanisms. Because the house went silent. There's no more illusion discs. There's no more gas. <laughs> I'm assuming there's gas. It has, it's coming from the bench. There, there's got to be some gas. Rory sat up and looked around his room. He gasped. <laughs> what happened to my? What happened to his room? Although the room Rory was in was still clearly his room with its blue-grey furniture and lavender grey and white wallpaper and white doors and purple-grey carpet and scattering of toys, it definitely wasn't his room as he remembered it. Yesterday, something in Rory's room had been clean and nice. Today, everything was dirty. <gasps> I love that. I love that detail. That's a great detail. Um, the wallpaper, for one thing, was peeling off the walls. White strips of the wallpaper above the chair rail were drooping down over it. The strips were were crusty, and the backside of them were yellow. The wallpaper above, or sorry, the wallpaper below the chair rail was peeling off the wall too. Some of it had fallen onto the carpet. The carpet was in awful shape as well. It was filthy. A thick coating. Of dust looked like a layer of fuzz. The fuzz was disturbed by a jumble of footprints. Rory leaned forward and stared at the prints. They were big, even bigger than his large feet. Had the creatures left the prints? One of the closet doors was sagging off its hinges. The other was bent. Both closet doors were covered with dust. Rory looked left and right at the other two doors. They were dingy and dusty too, but they were closed. Rory's hands froze. He looked at his quilt. It was no longer white. It was so dirty, it was almost brown. The material of the quilt was so thin too, and the triangular patches were coming apart from each other. And uh, Rory swung his legs over the side of the bed. Once again, he froze. Rory stared down at the bare legs. Where were his pyjamas? And why were his legs so long? And furry? And where did the hair come from? Huh? <laughs> what? Panicked, Rory shouted, Mom! The sound of, the, of Rory's voice nearly made him fall off the bed. Mom came out in a deep tone that sounded more like his dad's voice than his own. Has he aged? Or was he just like, like hmm. Is, is he illusioned to think that he is a child still? I'm, I'm confused, man. Rory pushed off the bed and stood. He now towered over the bed. His breathing came out in rapid bursts as he grabbed the doorknob. That's when he saw his hand. His hand was at least twice the size he remembered it being. The knob disappeared between or beneath his broad palm and long fingers. Hmm. That's that's actually very interesting. Has he has he actually been here for, for that long? Wow. Rory stepped up to the sink and looked into the mirror. His mouth dropped open and his eyes widened. The image in the mirror gaped back at him. Both Rory and the guy in the mirror opened their mouths wider and screamed, Mom! Rory's face was longer than he remembered, long and bony, and the cheekbones jutted out. The face still had some freckles, but red bumps of acne overpowered them. Below the acne, bristles of facial hair darkened a hard jawline, and his hair. Rory's hair was long, really long. It was still messy, but now the mess was a tangle that fell, that fell well past his shoulders, bare and wide but almost skeletal shoulders. Below the shoulders, a thin spray of dark blonde hair covered a skinny chest. Rory knew himself as a, as a seven-year-old kid, but what, what he was seeing in the mirror was more like a 17-year-old teenager. Rory looked down at his bare body. He shivered and looked around widely, as if the bathroom could help him figure out what had happened to him. Okay, 38 pages left. I'm going to take a small break and I'll be back. All right, a closer look at the bathroom, however, just made the mystery worse. The bathroom was a mess. The sink, toilet, and tub had uh, rusty-looking stains, and the tiled floor was scuffed and scummy. Paint peeled from the walls, the bathroom looked like one you'd find in a haunted house. Why? That's exactly my question. The clothes, however, weren't what Rory needed. For one thing, they were dirty and wrinkled and worn. For another, they were way, 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 way too small. Rory nearly tore his closet apart, trying to find something reasonable to put on. Eventually, he managed to find a pair of black and white zebra-shaped, uh, striped pyjama bottoms that he was able to squirm into. Is he a robot? <laughs> Is he a robot? Are there four of him? Um... The hems of the legs hit him at knee level, and the waistband was really tight, but he could have he could live with it. Uh, it was better than going around without pants on. 
The only shirt he could find that wasn't so small that it ripped when he tried to put it on was a bright red one. Um, <laughs> try and find a kid with a red shirt in one of the FNAF minigames. It fit him like it was painted onto his skin, and its hem landed just below his ribs, so his belly was bare. Again, though, it was better than nothing. The pyjama bottoms and the shirt didn't smell very good. They kind of stank, actually. They reeked of old sweat. They were a little stiff, too. But what other choice did Rory have? He wasn't going to wander around without any clothes on. Uh, he put on some socks and walked down the hallway. The hallway floor was weird, too. It wasn't the wood floor he remembered. Part of the floor was like that floor, but running down the middle of it was... A set of metal tracks embedded in the wood like streetcar tracks. Oh, that's so cool. So you're telling me, you're telling me that the nightmares are real robots that are just like on, on tracks. But I don't know if it's illusion technology or if it's this gas that's coming out of the vents. It's making him see the nightmares as real things and it's making him see the house as a complete illusion. This is crazy cool. This is, again, giving me really similar vibes to Help Wanted, but really, really good vibes to Help Wanted because I actually, I enjoyed Help Wanted. I thought the reveal was pretty good, even though it was quite predictable, but this is really freaking cool and it ties into FNAF 4 so well. Um, Rory had seen those once when his parents had taken him to a big city that had cool streetcars that went up and down steep hills. But why were those metal rails in his house? What were they for? The one thing I, I, I actually have a lot of questions on right now about the specific story, and I don't know if it's going to get answered or not, is memories. Like, he seems to have a lot of real memories um, about when his parents did something with him, or real memories about his parents. But his parents aren't around. Right? His parents aren't here right now. And so, are those, are those real memories? And if they are real memories, then why doesn't he remember coming here? And also, are there fake memories that are planted into his head? Because, like, he felt the need to go to school, but this clearly isn't his house. I'm, I'm a bit lost. I'm a, I'm a little bit lost with that. Like, all of, like, why does he remember certain things when they weren't real, or why is he remembering, I don't know, it, uh, hopefully it gets explained. I, I hope you know what I mean by that, all of that. Rory followed the tracks down the hall to the great room and found more of the same decay. The furniture was grimy and all the plush cushions were flattened. There was more peeling wallpaper in here and the shades that covered the windows were yellowed and limp, as if they could barely manage to cling their, uh, their brackets. Rory looked toward the kitchen. He chewed on his lower lip. There was no way his mom would have let her kitchen get into this state. Not only was it covered in dust, but crumbs were also everywhere. A trail of ants were marching out of the cabinet under the sink. Rory wrinkled his nose. The kitchen smelled awful too. Was it spoiled food? No, he didn't think so. The air smelled more like his, the way his grandma's attic had smelled when she'd had a leak in her roof. The thought of spoiled food made Rory's chest tighten. What if he had st slept for 10 years? Would there be any food left for him? Um, he goes to the fridge, opens it, and what in the world? The inside of the fridge didn't look like the inside of a fridge. It looked more like a dispenser with rows of food similar to the ones Rory had seen in vending machines. He leaned forward and looked at the small yellow wrappers that contained something about the size of a fun-sized candy bar. The packages looked old, their edges were a little ratty, and their labels had faded. Curious, Rory plucked one, one of the packages out. He opened it. Without much enthusiasm, Rory lifted a crunchy-looking tan wafer from the packaging. He held it to his nose. It smelled of, like vanilla, but not really. Um, okay, the water still runs, so he has a drink. When Rory had washed away the dry remains of the wafer, he straightened. What now? Rory had to find his mom. Maybe she could explain what was going on. When he reached her door, he called out, Mom! She didn't answer, so he tried to she, He tried the door. It was locked. Rory backed away from the door and frowned at it. The door, he realised, wasn't actually a door. It had no hinge, and there were no gaps around the edges of the door uh, where it could open away from the wall. Why did his parents' room have a fake door? Rory turned away from the bizarre in, imi, imitation door. Sorry. Uh, he could hear the shower running behind the door a few feet further down the hall, so he moved on and stopped in front of the bathroom door. His mum had to be in the shower. She'd tell him what was going on. When Rory reached for the bathroom door, though, he discovered that it, too, was not a real door. Rory put his ear to the slab of wood that was masquerading as a door. 
Why was he hearing a shower? Cocking his head, Rory noticed that the running water sound was not coming from the other side of the fake door as he assumed it was. The door was coming from... The sound was coming from above the door. Rory stepped back and looked up. He screwed up his face as he stared at a rectangular black speaker sat, uh, set high on the wall. The shower sound came from that speaker. Rory opened his mouth to call for his mum again, but he abruptly clamped his lips together. If the doors weren't real and the shower wasn't real, was his mum real? Yeah, that's my question right now. That is actually my question. Obviously, his mum is real. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't exist. But, like, is she... It's hard to phrase a question around it, you know? She doesn't live with him, obviously. Like, she, he is currently alone. He is a lonely child that has been kidnapped into this experimentation facility by Afton. I feel like, at least. What is this? Wait, that's gonna get copyrighted. Shoot. <laughs> I'll sing it for you. Oh, the misery. Everybody wants to be my enemy. Share the sympathy. Why is there a picture of soap? Okay. Everybody wants to be my enemy. Me, me. Okay. His legs a little shaky and his heart pounding, Rory turned to continue on down the hall. This hall, like the one on the other side of his bedroom, had the same metal tracks set into the wooden floor. Rory followed the tracks and he saw that they split into two sets by his bedroom door. Okay. One set of tracks veered toward his room, the other set ran onto the end of the hall. The second set disappeared underneath another door. Was that one real? Rory ignored the questionable door and followed the metal tracks into his room. There, he saw the tracks continued. They were set into the carpet. Why hadn't he seen them earlier? He'd probably been too baffled to see any- uh, sorry. He'd probably been too baffled by everything else to notice the floor. Now though, he followed the tracks. They led to his bed. Rory scanned the rest of the carpet in his room. Another set of tracks ran from the closet to the bed, and another set ran from the other side of the bed to the doorway leading to the left side hall. He follows the left hallway tracks and they end up to a door at the end of the hall. The end of the hall? The end of the hall. Examining the door, Rory decided that this one was real. It had hinges and cracks around the edge of its dirty, white painted surface. <sighs> oh my god, we're gonna see Afton's facility? Please, please, I beg. Rory grasped the door's knob and turned it. At first, the door didn't budge, but Rory was determined to get it open, so he took hold of the knob with both hands and yanked. The door popped open. Just in case you aren't aware, like, uh, one of the big theories um, with FNAF 4 was the, was the fact that the nightmares could be real, and all of it was a testing facility in place by William Afton himself. Um, I, I'm just going over this because some people actually might be confused. I didn't, I didn't realize some of you might be confused why I'm saying Afton's facility, you know? And by that, I mean, if you look at the map in sister location, you can actually see there are, um, there are kind of like mappings out of the FNAF 4 location. You can see the plush trap hallway. You can see, I think you can see the main, um, the, the main structure of, of the actual, house etc um and so and so like people believe that because you can see that above sister location because that house is above sister location and because there is that secret code that you can point into the put into the wall i think it's 1987 it might be 1983 actually i think it's 1983 uh and when you type in 1983 into the keypad and sister location you can see the fnaf 4 um location and it, it's very clear by that, that William Afton was talking through a walkie-talkie into the Fredbear plushies that are actually secret cameras and he was testing on the crying child. Possibly not the crying child. I don't think it's the crying child anymore. Um, it, yeah, I, I don't think it's the crying child. I don't think the crying child was ever tested on. I think it was just kids that he kidnapped. And, and if we're saying that Fazbear Frights is canon, I'm not saying that. I, I'm just putting it out there for the people who do say that Fast for Frights is connected to the game's universe. Perhaps a possibility we could think about is is that that William tortured Andrew, and and if we're saying that, then Andrew that 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 gives reason for Andrew to be the one you shouldn't have killed, right? Because he tortured Andrew, therefore or Andrew later on tortured him. It's it's a perfect loop around, right? Um, and they both escaped in some way, um, and got their revenge. 
So I think that's that's an interesting thought process. Um, but you could say the same about Cassidy, really, because there's there's no real reason for Cassidy to be the one you shouldn't have killed at the moment. Um, like like there's no motive for her to be more vengeful than, than the others. So like that's interesting. I I feel like that is very interesting. So what's gonna happen with Rory here? Rory started to turn to run, but before he completed the turn, he realised that he wasn't seeing what he thought he was seeing. He had, he nearly, he suddenly understood no reason to run. Rory took a deep breath. He faced what was in the closet. Looking back at him from the shadows of a small, dusty enclosure, the decrepit purple-blue bunny that was a major player in Rory's ongoing nightmares gazed, dark-eyed and still, straight ahead. The bunny was as Rory remembered it from his night terrors. It had tattered fur torn apart so horribly that Rory could see completely through the gaping holes, uh, holes in the bunny's torso. The bunny had deadly looking teeth and claws, but those teeth and claws were rigid and unmoving now. Rory took a step forward. He leaned in and examined the metal that, could, that you could see through the ratty fur. Rory's nightmare creature was nothing more than a spooky life-size figurine. <laughs> Let's go! Let's go! It couldn't move on its own. It was transported into Rory's room on rails. It was just a mechanical track. I love this. I love this reveal. What is this? Oh. I mean, yo, uh, fire! <laughs> oh, it's, what True. Do you say, bro? Like, yo, this is peak. This is peak. There's nothing that can be done here that can be improved on. This is peak. <laughs> it is pretty peak. <laughs> it is pretty peak, my friend. Okay. Let's go. Let's go, 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 go. Okay. Oh, the end of Tales from the Pizza Plex. I can't believe it. We do have two more stories to go after this, of course. We do have B72 and the other one. <laughs> What's it called? Um, it's something really generic. I'm sorry. Uh, Rory clenched his fists. He slammed the door into the phony creature's face and he turned in, uh, to stride back into the room. There, Rory marched to the closet. He investigated the back of it and he quickly found the fox version of the creatures that terrorised him at night. Rory stomped out of the closet and went to his bed. Dropping to his knees, he found a flap in the carpet. Under the carpet was a trapdoor. Beneath the trapdoor, he saw the horrific bear that always blocked his escape from the creatures. It too was nothing more than an oversized puppet. His head starting to pound, Rory left his room via the door on the right and followed the hallway's tracks to the door at the end of the hall. There, he found the disintegrating chick and its cupcake. It was all fake. Every bit of it. But why? He figures out all the doors in the house were fake. He returned to the kitchen, unable to let go of a hunch he had about the refrigerator. Although stocked with the dry wafers, the dispenser had to be refilled from somewhere. It was attached to the fridge's sides by metal clips. It, it just took a sharp tug for the dispenser to groan and twang and let go of the clips. Rory fell back and barely kept his distance. Or balance, sorry. Tossing aside the refrigerator's, the dispenser's guts, sorry, he looked into the fridge. It wasn't actually a fridge. There was no back to the appliance. Instead, the fridge's interior was a tunnel-like enclosure that extended back behind the fridge, reaching through the kitchen's wall. The metal tunnel led to a metal door. Although the door now had no handle, Rory could clearly see its edges. He opens the door, clambers forward, and looked through the opening. Nothing but blackness looked back at him, but that was better than a pair of glowing eyes. Because it's so black, Rory goes back into the kitchen to get a flashlight. Now in the pale yellow glow of barely their light, Rory could see the bent metal door lying on what looked like a concrete floor. The floor looked like it was just a few feet below the opening. Rory was in the concrete corridor. In the faint glow of his flashlight, it was hard to see the details of what was around him. The corridor, however, appeared to be lined with metal racks. The racks were filled with, of all things, something that looked like scuba tanks? Huh? <coughs> oh, bless me. <laughs> um, Rory stepped over to one. He aimed his light at some writing on it. Sorry, I... Oh, that, that got me. Um, danger, compressed... Compressed gas! Gas! <laughs> oh, this story's great. This story's great. I was right with the gas. I mean, it had to be gas, right? It was coming through the vents. Rory looked around some more. All the tanks, he realised, were connected to rubber hoses. The network lined the hallway, and they all came together in a cluster that fed into the wall next to the opening Rory had just come through. Whatever the gas was, it was being pumped into Rory's house. <laughs> oh my god! This is great! He follows the hoses, which led him to an old grey machine at the end of the corridor. Rory didn't know anything about machines, but he could tell this one wasn't running. He had a fan, sort of like the purple one in his room, and the fan's blades were still. Ah, I see. 
No sound came from the machine. Yeah, it broke down. That's why you can see through the illusion now. That's great. That's This is really good storytelling. A few feet beyond the machine, just before an open doorway, Rory came to a small grey metal desk. Rory aimed his light at the desk's surface, and the beam illuminated the metal part of the clipboard. Maybe something on the papers would explain what was going on. The first thing Rory saw on top of the sheet of paper was a date. <gasps> it was a date just a month after his 17th birthday. Or 7th. <laughs> Uh, he read a handwritten entry next to the date. Subject continues to react with fear. To what perceives to be creatures. Fear level 9. Perceives to be. Rory repeated. Rory pursed his lips. Rory wasn't the best reader in the world. He struggled with reading in school. But his friend Wade was a really good reader. He was also a water boy. Uh, he'd taught Rory lots of words. So Rory knew what perceives meant. It meant that his brain was telling something. And given the way that the entry on the clipboard was worded, Rory concluded that whatever his brain was telling him wasn't necessarily the truth. I'm a little bit confused. Like, like the, the thing I'm confused about right now is why why he's aged? Why why he's suddenly old? Like, I feel like that's an irrelevant part of the story at the moment, but maybe we'll get some insight into that later. Rory read as fast as he could. He flipped through the pages on the clipboard. Because most of the entries were short and nearly all of them were the same or similar, it didn't take Rory long to figure out what he was looking at. A straight-backed black metal chair sat, uh, saw in front of the desk. Um, okay, Rory, too, shot to continue standing, dropped onto it. He stared at the clipboard. Then he turned and aimed his, black, his light back down the corridor at the rows of gas tanks. Finally, he shifted the light to the machine that wasn't running. Tears filled Rory's eyes. At the same time, his face heated up. He clenched his teeth. It was all fake. Everything he thought he knew about his life was a lie. Did I ever live? Did I ever have the life I thought I was living? Yeah, that's my question. Did you actually have a life beforehand? Um, in Rory's mind, the house uh, he'd woke up in that morning was his house, although... The house in his memories was clean and new and tidy, but none of the images in Rory's head were real. Nothing in Rory's life was real. You, you'll better sit down for this, because ladies and gentlemen, none of this, the explanation for the FNAF 4. Okay, this is what we were waiting for. What is the explanation for FNAF 4? I think I can piece it together without even reading this paragraph, but let's just read it. I'm going to have to do a video about this in the next, like, week. <laughs> According to the papers on the clipboard, the gas in the gas tanks were hallucinogens. I actually said that right. Wow. These were drugs that made him think he was seeing and doing things he wasn't seeing and doing. The gas was what made him think he was living in the house with his parents. The gas made him think that he had to go to school. The gas made him think he was eating real food when in fact the whole time he was eating the awful wafers. The wafers, the papers said, were freeze-dried sources of all the- okay this is irrelevant- <laughs> all the nutrients a human body needed. That might have been true, Rory thought, but now, given how skinny he was, he didn't think the wafers were good enough for him anymore. The gas was also the sources of his night terrors. Apparently, the whole thing was a nasty experiment designed to study the effects of ongoing fear in children. Whoever was behind the experiment wanted to see what would happen if a child faced the same horrors night after night after night with no life, with no real life during the day to balance the awfulness of the nightmares. Ah, okay. Okay. So, yeah, that makes so some sort of sense. Because the last entry on the clipboard had been made the same year that Rory had turned seven, he concluded that this awful place had been abandoned ten years before. Oh. Wait. So we're saying Rory's been here for ten years while the gas has still been going through and now the gas has run out? Oh, that's sad. That's really sad. It was just abandoned with the child in it. Oh my god. Am I getting that right? I, I don't know if I'm getting that right. It seems a little bit of a stretch, but... Okay. Rory looked again at the silent machine. He wasn't sure, but he thought the machine was a pump. If it was, it was reasonable for the stream of gas that kept Rory living an illusion. It must have broken down. Rory hadn't been sleeping for the last 10 years, he'd been up and conscious. Everything he'd done though, he'd done in a haze caused by the gas that constantly hissed into the house through the vents in the ceiling. That gas had kept him from seeing what he was, what was really going on around him. It had kept him locked in a perpetual childhood, understanding his surroundings on only the most basic level. 
That gas had kept Rory in a gel of misery. Um, okay, Rory disconnects a big hose from the machine so it doesn't restart again. That's good. That's that's good thinking. What now? Rory asked himself. The answer to that question was easy. Rory had to get out of this place. Huh. So my 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 my, my, my question is why why Afton? Why why is Afton doing this? Why is he experimenting on children with illusion technology? Oh, oh yeah, illusion technology. For sure. Right? Hallucinogens. Yeah, he's testing he's testing if illusions actually work. I I don't know. It's hard. Rory pointed his light through a narrow doorway just beyond the metal desk. That was his only option now, so he stepped through it and found himself in another corridor. Although this one wasn't lined with gas tanks or rubber hoses, it still had snakes running all over the walls. Snakes. These snakes were made out of metal and they looked like electrical lines or maybe water pipes. Rory couldn't really tell. This corridor was dirtier than the last one. The corridor's pale grey walls were covered with streaks of grease and the lines and pipes had woolly layers of dust. It smelled like a mechanic's shop. The rooms were disturbing. One of them, one was obviously some kind of observation station. It had slanted glass walls that looked out at a darkness Rory couldn't see into. Above one of the glass walls, there was a panel of unlit coloured light. Even though the lights weren't on, Rory could see that the four lights were different colours. Oh my god! The FNAF 4 location isn't above sister location. It's in sister location. Wow. Wow. So if, if you don't understand... Uh, I haven't actually read the full sentence. Even though the lights went on, Rory could see that the four lights were different colours. One blue, one green, one pink, and one yellow. I'm. If I scroll down right now, I'm gonna see the circus gallery. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but if you look at the circus gallery, there is a pink, a green, a blue, and a yellow light, right? And we never actually see into circus gallery. Remember that we never see baby in circus gallery, and that's probably because in circus gallery, um, is that what is that right? Circus gallery. Entering Circus Gallery. Something like that, yeah. I think it's Circus Gallery. Um, we, we never actually see into that room. And so I feel like... Oh, that makes so much sense. Let's look at the map. Okay, wait. On an adjacent glass wall, a poster of a wild-looking girl with red pigtails! And the words celebrate printed across the top. This is crazy! This is so crazy. Okay. Now, let's look at this map. We're going to do a little bit of theorizing here. I'm sorry this is taking so long. I'm sorry it's taking so long, but this has great payoff, and this is great potential for a theory video. So, yeah, circus gallery, right? Circus control. So let's look at this real quick. So, oh god, I'm actually terrible at this. Alright, so, plush trap hallway is down here, below Belora's. Oh, so there, oh, so there's a vent? There's like a ventilation, oh, I don't know. Something goes from Belora's into plush traps, right? This is Belora's gallery. And then you go down into here, through into the plush trap hallway. All of these doors are fakish. They're not... Wait, imagine if this plays into... Imagine if this plays into Help Wanted 2 and we're actually in this facility and we get to see all of the different places. Wow. So... Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals is actually just Afton's big facility where Afton does all of his experimentation and illusion disc testing. That's, I mean, that does make sense. That does make sense. I don't know why we all immediately went to think that, um, that above Sister Location was FNAF 4. I don't know why we all just magically went to that conclusion. I guess it's because the elevator goes down. But we never even thought about the fact that these rooms could be separate and they could be in sister location itself. So then, what is this? Oh, that's, that's, wait. That makes no sense. Because this is Fredbear's. Hmm, I'm a little bit confused. 
I'm a little bit confused right now. So, okay, this makes sense, right? So, we have FNAF 4, the FNAF 4 Knights here, top right. You can see my mouse, right? I, I hope you can see my mouse. But in the top right, you have FNAF 4 gameplay. And then that's connected to this. That's connected to the anode room, the secret anode room. Which makes sense because that's where the cameras are that look into the FNAF 4 rooms. That makes a lot of sense. That's where Afton would be sitting, taking his notes that we just saw as he came out. But, th but then how come... How is... Hmm, how is Rory seeing the four lights if he isn't in below in Circus Gallery? That's interesting, because then this on the top left would be the mini games. The mini game house. I'm a little bit confused about that, but we will we will do some thinking into that and I will tell you more if I if I think about any anything else in my next theory video. Uh, Rory then enters a room that contained a big dance floor with a stage. On the stage, a metal ballerina was frozen in place with her arms above her head. I cannot believe <laughs> that, uh, that we're getting this in this story. This is crazy. She wore a purple metal skirt, the stiff kind that stuck out from the waist. Now he sees a fl uh, floor, the far side of the room. He runs towards it and it leads to another corridor. Corridor leads to another room, a room filled with wires connected to a breaker box. He then goes to the breaker blocks, box and flips the switches. Nothing happens when he does this. He turns left out of the breaker room, leading to a dead end. But another corridor is there to the right, which he walks down. He finds two open doorways. Hmm. Checking the one on the left first, he discovered a room filled with what looked like animatronic parts. Metal arms and legs and heads and torsos were stacked on shelves, along with tangles of wires and metal uh, wires and mounds of gears. He goes to the room on the right. Rory spotted a faded sign of the stage that read Funtime Auditorium. In the shadows of the corner not far away from the doorway leading out of the room, he, he the cracked and dusty shell of an animatronic pirate fox lay crumpled against the wall. If he went right, he'd go into the corridor that leads into the breaker room. He goes through the corridor and goes through a corridor he passed to his right. He finds the room that's the heart of the place. He didn't care about the big, currently non-functioning fan on the end wall between the glass door between the glass walls. Wait, his escape is literally just to go up the elevator. That's mad. <gasps> oh my god! Imagine if he goes up the elevator and he finds himself at the pizza place. <laughs> he finds himself at the pizza place underneath the pizza flex, and that's how it's tails on the pizza flex. That would be crazy. Um, he didn't care about the big, currently non-functioning fan on the end wall between the glass walls. The weird clown faces on the wall, near the fan and the puppet masks on stands atop two cabinets of metal drawers under the fan didn't interest him either. He goes through the drawers in the room and finds a blueprint there labelled Underground Testing Facility. Beyond this room, down a short hallway, there is an elevator. He goes in the elevator, presses the button he sees, but it doesn't work. Oh right, of course the elevator didn't work, no lights, no power. He goes to the control room, finds a small battery-powered two-way radio in one of the drawers. He knew how to use these. He and his friend Wade had used walkie-talkies a lot. Rory to Wade. Come in, Wade. Co over. Wade, this is Rory. Do you read? Over. Rory, is that really you? Really? Wade. Yeah, dude. Where are you? Wade states that he kept the walkie-talkie because he felt sentimental about it. Turns out the police gave up Rory's search just after a year. Wow. Wow, they just gave up. His, his parents hired private detectives, though, even made a website and everything. Oh, Wade mentions Rory's dog, Fido, and the fact that he now has a little sister. She's nine now. Also, Wade got Riz because he has a girlfriend. Rory tells him everything about the testing facility. Wade mentions that since the house has power still, he should go back there, find and unplug the generator that's powering the house, and plug it into the elevator to escape. Good plan, good plan. Uh, Rory gave Wade a detailed description of the house and the concrete corridors and rooms in the testing facility. Wade states that he had called the cops, but Rory has doubts since the cops couldn't find him in the first place, so what's the luck they'll find him here? You better get going, says Wade. Okay, responds Rory. Let me know how it goes. I'll be here. Thanks. I will. Um, should note that Wade says you can't trace these old radios, but it'd be easier if Rory had a cell phone. Okay. 
Straightening his shoulders, Rory left the kitchen and headed down the right hall. I can do this, he told himself as he walked toward the closet door at the end of the hall. That's when the closet door opened. Uh-oh. A grinding whir filled the hallway and the ratty yellow chick-like creature started moving. Rory's nightmare was coming to life. It's just a mechanical monster, he said aloud. Lifting his gaze, Rory looked ahead at the holy yellow chick. You're not real, he said to it. The machine acts like it should, clanking its metal feet to Rory's bedroom via the metal rails. Just get on with it, Rory told himself. Rushing forward, Rory checked out the now empty closet to see if it held a generator. It didn't. Oh no! He enters the kitchen and wonders if the uh, generator is here in disguise since he hears a motor hum sound that he knows can't come from the fridge. He opens the cabinet, rub rips off a rubber uh, cover under it and uncovers the generator. He starts pulling the generator out of his place. Three birds with one stone. I'll get all your key cards. I'll get the perfect specimen and I don't have to deal with that thing down there. And it's all thanks to you. Now to have your pancreas. Huh? Oh. <laughs> That's a Garden of Bam Bam reference. <laughs> I was just like, what? What's happening here? Is, is Afton talking? <laughs> Um, hello, Rory. Please don't disrupt the generator, Rory, the voice said. Oh, is it Afton? Please, please be Afton, please. Please don't disrupt the generator, Rory, the voice said. Rory immediately spotted a large white speaker on the ceiling above him, tucked between two grey metal light fixtures. The speaker blended right into the white painted ceiling. Who are you? Rory asked the voice. Generator is what keeps you running, Rory, the voice said. It's taking care of you. The voice coming from the speaker was a man's voice. Maybe a man about Rory's dad's age. The voice was low and smooth. It was calm and soothing. Who are you? Rory asked again. You want to know. You, you, you know what you want to be here, Rory, the voice said. And the generator makes it possible for you to stay here. It's hooked up to a steady supply of gas, Rory. Always there for you. Why can't I see you? Rory asked. You ran away from home, the voice said. Don't you remember? <laughs> Midnight motorist. Midnight motorist. You didn't fit in at school, Rory, the boy said. I feel like the entirety of FNAF has just been solved. I'm not even kidding. Like, those were two massive stickling points. FNAF 4, what the hell is FNAF 4? Midnight Motorist, how the hell does Midnight Motorist fit in? This is it. Midnight Motorist was showing the kidnapping of a child. Or, or, Midnight Motorist was showing Afton's kidnapping of the children to experiment on in his underground sister location facility, which also included the FNAF 4 rooms. Oh my god. Okay, this is going to be a great video that's going to come out. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Uh, you didn't fit in at school, Rory, the voice said. Rory's question suddenly didn't feel important. Even though Rory couldn't see who was speaking, the sound of the voice felt like a warm hug. Interesting. He closed his eyes, and in mind, he could see a reassuring smile. You had so much trouble in class, Rory. The voice said. You couldn't understand the equations in math. You had trouble with your reading. Rory frowned. Yes, he remembered that now. He hated school. He felt stupid when he was at school. He felt like he was wrong somehow. Like he couldn't get anything right. He felt like an outcast at school. Wade was his only friend. And the girls, Rory. The voice continued. Remember how the girls thought you were wimpy? He remembered that too now. Or well, he remembered that now too. That was why he and Wade built their clubhouse. Girls didn't like Wade either. So they built a place where girls weren't allowed. You came here because you knew you'd be taken care of here. Oh, wow. Really? So why does orange guy say he ran back to that place again? What place is he talking about? Hmm. You have been taken care of here. You're never an outcast. You're never wrong. You've been watched over and cared for. That was something your parents never did, Rory. Remember? Yeah, because his dad shouts at him. Wow. Yes, he remembered. All his parents ever did was work. His dad was never home. His mum was gone most of the time too. And when she was home, all she ever did was sit and watch the TV. <laughs> all she ever did was tell him how wrong he was. Don't leave smudges, Rory. Pick up your clothes, Rory. Make your bed, Rory. Comb your hair, Rory. It's a mess. Rory's mum cared more about how things looked than she did about her own son. You're safe here, Rory. This is your home. You've been watched over here. 
you've never been abandoned, never left alone. All these years you've been, ta you've been cared for because you're special, Rory, and you deserve to live in this special place, safe and secure, never alone. This is your home. Damn, he's got bars. <laughs> Rory starts self-doubting about his escape. No one besides Wade had liked Rory when he was little. That was the whole reason he'd run away to begin with. He'd never even been able to be what people wanted him to be. He'd always come up short. He never did anything the way anyone wanted. Not his parents, not his teachers, and not the other kids in class. Why would it be any different now? Did Rory really want to go back to a world where he didn't fit in? It had been 10 years. He hadn't learned anything in that time. He'd be so far behind. He'd be more, he'd be even more of an outcast than he'd been before. All he'd ever do was let people down. All he'd ever be was lonely. Rory's eyes welled up and tears began streaming down his face. No, Rory couldn't go home. This place, no matter how fake, was the only home where he'd fit in? What? He goes back to the machine and realises it turned off because its power cord was loose. Rory pushed the cord back into its socket and the machine roared to life. The gas was flowing again. He put the door back on the fridge, starts feeling tired and goes back to bed. At the end of the concrete corridor, filled with gas tanks, the gas pump rumbled steadily. In the ceiling above the pump, behind a metal gate grate, a tape recorder clicked. It then whirred loudly, the sound of a cassette rewinding. Another click. The cassette was once again ready for the next time Rory wandered too far. Oh my god. That's such a good ending. A tape recorder. So he's escaped before, but he's always come back. That's actually really sad. That's actually terrifying. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That was, that was a great story. That's a perfect finish to that story, man. I have something to do with this awesome Dittophobia monologue. You're safe here, Rory. This is your home. Yeah, that's great. That's, wow. That, that monologue is, is sick, by the way, yeah. That monologue is so cool. Well. I'm speechless. This is the biggest law reveal we have ever had in any story ever. This might be the biggest law reveal full stop. I, I, I did think that GGY had the biggest law reveal. That Gregory was patient 46. I thought that that was the biggest law reveal. But... When we think about it, that, that wasn't even that big because it was also like current time for NAF. We just got a story at the end of Tales on the Pizza Plex that confirmed a lot of doubts we had about FNAF 4. That pretty much just solved Midnight Motorist. Gave us a little bit more of Afton's kind of um, motivations, a, a, a little bit kind of, especially motivations to do with experimentation. And gave us some insight on sister location. Wow. I am actually speechless. Guys, if you enjoyed this story, let me know in the comments below. I know this has been a very long one. This has been a long one because I've been talking a lot, sure. But uh, it was worth it, man. Thank you so much for listening to my commentary. Thank you so much to Peep for live reading. And, and while we're at it, Thank you to all of the live readers for ever live reading uh, Tales from the Pizza Plex. And Tom, Say, C-E-Y, Seba, William Blaine, Alton, Cube, and Scruffy. Thank you guys so much for live reading. Guys, next time we're going to be doing B72. But before that, I do want to make a video on Dizophobia because this is big and I'm very late to it. <laughs> but um, I have a lot of thoughts going around my head right now and um, I will... I will be excited to present them in my next video. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you then. Goodbye.